Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I am the director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. I am delighted to welcome you to the briefing this afternoon on the national security implications of climate change. We are honored for this briefing to happen and at this very timely point in time as well as we look at these important issues. And I want to uh, express my, my gratitude and enthusiasm for the partnership that we have in terms of bringing you this briefing through the partnership with the Henry M. Jackson Foundation as well as the Center for Climate and Security. And I wanted to be sure and mention that we are joined by some members from the Henry M. Jackson Foundation today, including John Hempelman, who is the president of the Jackson Foundation Board, as well as Laura Eglitson, who is the foundation's executive director. So thank you very, very much for your support for your long understanding and visionary approach to this important issue and in carrying out the legacy of Senator Scoop Jackson, who set up the, who, for whom the foundation was set up to continue his unfinished work in the areas in which he for so long played a very key leadership role while he was here in the Congress and especially in the Senate, where he also chaired the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, but where he took such an important leadership role with regard to international affairs, education, human rights, environment and natural resources management, and very importantly, the whole role of public service. So we are very, very grateful to the Jackson Foundation, also very, very grateful to the Center for Climate and Security with whom we are also partnering with regard to this briefing. And we are going to be hearing from a number of people who have a long history and who have given much, much thought to this important issue of climate. What does this really mean for national security? What are the angles that need to be thought about? And to first start off this briefing, I want to first introduce uh, Colonel Tom Watson, who is the Director of Government Affairs for the Center for Climate and Security. Carol, thank you very much. Uh, the Center for Climate and Security is delighted to co-sponsor this event today with EESI, and uh, thanks to our ESI partners uh, for all your hard work to put this together. Uh, the Center for Climate and Security would also like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to join us today for the National Security Implications of Climate Change, a briefing to discuss the role of climate change as a threat multiplier in the geopolitical landscape and the implications that it has for national security. This briefing will explore the risk management and uh, planning considerations facing the Department of Defense as it seeks to maintain force readiness and bolster infrastructure resilience. We think you'll find today's panel both timely and informative on this important issue. The Center for Climate and Security is a nonpartisan secur security and foreign policy institute with a distinguished advisory board of nationally recognized military, security, and foreign policy experts, some of whom are here today as part of our panel. The Center for Climate and Security envisions a climate resilient international security landscape to further this goal, the Center for Climate and Security facilitates policy development processes and dialogues like today's panel, as well as providing analysis, conducting research, and acting as a resource hub in the climate and security field. It is now my pleasure to introduce your moderator for today's event, the Honorable John Conger. Mr. Conger is a member of the Center for Climate and Security's Advisory Board, in addition, he is an independent consultant and president of the Congress Strategy and Solutions, LLC, and a non-resident senior advisor at the Center for Strategy and International Studies. Mr. Conger previously served as the principal deputy under Secretary of Defense Comptroller, where he provided advice to the Secretary of Defense on budgetary and financial matters. He has also overseen energy, installation, and environmental policy throughout DOD as the Assistant Secretary for Defense 
for Energy, Installation, and Environment. He served as the Acting Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Installations and Environment, as well as the Assistant Deputy Undersecretary for Installations and Environment. Mr. Conger has also served as a staff member here in Congress, including a professional staff of the House International Relations Committee. Prior to that, he was employed in the private sector as an aerospace engineer and defense analyst supporting the office of the Secretary of Defense. He has multiple degrees from MIT and a master's from George Washington University. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce your moderator for today, Mr. John Conger. Sir, the podium is yours. How are we all doing today? Good? It's a little bit warm in here. We're going to keep the door open so that the airflow is okay, but, uh, but we're going to get background noise. So, so that's the trade-off you're all going to have. Um, so uh, thank you for being here today for what I, I hope is going to be a pretty enlightening discussion. Uh, you, you heard a couple times the reference to how timely this was. Um, I want to thank President Trump for making news last week on this topic. Uh, the, uh, we did not plan that in advance. Um, but nonetheless, um, as we go forward with the, with the change in administration uh, from uh, President Obama to President Trump, uh, the apparent change of opinions on climate change, uh, we can't help but wonder whether this topic is still one that the DOD is going to care about. Uh, whether this was all just politics at the beginning or whether there's a really a core national security issue that drives DOD's interest in the impacts of climate change. Uh, I'm going to give you a preliminary answer to that by quoting Secretary Mattis, President Trump's Secretary of Defense. Uh, his quote was, uh, I agree that the effects of a changing climate, such as increased maritime access to the Arctic, rising sea levels, desertification, among others, impact our security situation. I will ensure that the department continues to be prepared to conduct operations today and in the future and that we're prepared to address the effects of a changing climate on our threat assessments, resources, and readiness. So that's the bottom line, uh, that DOD will adapt to changes in the climate and position itself to best ensure that it can carry out its mission and defend the country. Uh, the DOD knows what they're doing, and they'll be measured in responding to this risk, but there's a lot you can do to mitigate risk once you acknowledge the risk exists. Uh, today we have a group of experts, each of whom is a member of the Board of Advisors to the Center on Climate and Security, and each of whom are uniquely qualified to address these points. They'll talk about why DOD still cares about climate change, how it affects the DOD mission, and the ability to carry out mission today and in the future. So I'm going to introduce everybody and call on each one of them to make some opening comments, and then we'll do some questions and answers. I'm going to ask that the panelists during their opening comments talk about any facet of the problem that they wish, but to include in their thoughts one starting question to blend in with their intro, uh, in the absence of politics, how would DOD approach this issue? Setting aside the focus on climate by President Obama and the resistance to focus on it by President Trump, what would DOD do? So that's sort of a, uh, an entry-level thought. Uh, let me, I'm going to go through and introduce everybody all at once and then uh, pass it to them to, to make their comments. So uh, immediately to my left uh, is Sherry Goodman. She is a member of our advisory board and a senior fellow with the Wilson Center. Uh, prior to this role, she was CEO and president of the Ocean Leadership Consortium and senior vice president and general counsel and corporate secretary of the Center for Naval Analyses. Uh, she, before that, in the Pentagon, she was the deputy undersecretary of defense for environmental security. And I will say that few people have done more at the nexus of climate and security, particularly her shepherding of the seminal series of reports issued by CNA, starting with the National Security and the Threat of Climate Change report in 2007. To her left, uh, General Ron Keyes uh, is a member of the Center in climate, uh, of, on Climate and Security's Advisory Board and chairman of the CNA Military Advisory Board. So that's the board that put out the study I just referenced. Uh, most recently, he co-authored a report on sea level rise in the U.S. military's mission uh, issued by the Center on Climate and Security, and there should be copies uh, in the front table. Uh, general Keyes is a retired four-star general from the Air Force. Uh, he retired in November 2007 after completing a career of more than 40 years. He is a command pilot with more than 4,000 flying hours in fighter aircraft, including more than 300 hours of combat time. He has seen climate challenges as an operator around the world, and as commander confronting the, the impact uh, of climate on operational readiness at Langley Air Force Base, now Joint Base Langley-Eustis uh, here at home. 
To his left, uh, Dr. Jerry Galloway is a, member of this, uh, is a member of the Center on Climate and Security's Advisory Board and a co-author of the aforementioned study on sea level rise. He's a professor of engineering at the University of Maryland, focused on water resources and disaster management. And he is also a fellow at the uh, Texas A&M Hagler Institute for Advanced Studies, working on urban flooding in the United States. He joined the faculty of the University of Maryland following a 38-year career in the US Army, retiring as a Brigadier General, and served eight additional years in the federal government. Professor Galloway is the former Dean of the Faculty in Academic Programs at the Industrial College of the Armed Forces and former Dean of the Academic Board at uh, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where he was a professor of geography and the first head of the Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering. And last but not least, Rear Admiral Ann Phillips uh, is a member of the, Center, uh, of the Center's Advisory Board. Previously, she had a 31-year career in the U.S. Navy as a surface warfare officer. Uh, she commanded Destroyer Squadron 28 and Expeditionary Strike Group 2, and she was a member of the uh, Navy's Climate Change and Energy Task Forces. Uh, after retirement, she chaired an infrastructure working group at, for the Hampton Roads Sea Level Rise Preparedness and Resilience Intergovernmental Pilot Planning Project. So thanks to, to each of you for, for being here, and I'll turn it over to Sherry for opening comments. It's great to be here with all of you today. Thank you to the Jackson Foundation, to uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, to CSS uh, and um, EESI for organizing this. Many of you looking around for Carol can remember when we could hardly fill a room um, on this subject, let alone standing room only. So 30 years ago, 30 years ago, I was the youngest and only female staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, at a time when Senator Jackson still served in the Senate. I worked for Senator Nunn, who had just become chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, Senator Warner, John Warner of Virginia, was a ranking Republican. Uh, and there were many days and many times when there was absolutely no difference between Democrats and Republicans on the issues that we worked. Um, and so I come and speak to you about this subject from a long bipartisan tradition that has been the hallmark of national security policy making and practice in this country um, that has has been around for decades and which I think is incredibly important to this subject uh, and to many others in national security that we face today because we are living in a, a time that's highly polarized. Uh, but 30 years ago, um, what was more common was that on the armed services committees, they could barely spell the word environment. In fact, that was not my portfolio at all. Um, as most of my colleagues here uh, who are old enough like me. I was more like the age of many of you in the audience then. Um, and at that time, we were working on things like nuclear weapons and arms control and um, military readiness and troop readiness. All these issues are still very important. Um, but during that early, in the early post-Cold War period, in this Cold War period, we began to understand the practices of the industrial age that had led to environmental challenges. Um, and so the armed services committees, both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats created within the Defense Department something that still endures till today called the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, which took research and the science capability. I think this is very important. Um, a sort of underlying factor here that science, research, technology development, innovation are a core component of everything that we do as Americans, but everything that occurs in national security and that undergirds our understanding of what our threats are. Because in the first instance in national security, you start from what are your threats. Uh, in the nuclear age, we understood the nuclear threat. We spent billions of dollars of America's GDP to um, defend and deter what we consider to be the highest, uh, highest uh, consequence, but very low probability 
threat of a bolt out of the blue strike from the Soviet Union. Now, in the climate age, we have in climate change, arguably, a uh, equally high, potentially high consequence and higher probability threat. So that is our challenge. But we think of it in terms of risk. What are the risks? And then we plan and program uh, and, and budget accordingly to reduce those risks to our forces, to reduce the risks uh, in operating around the world. So now when we look around the world today, um, we see that there are, there are many threats, of course, terrorism, um, right on our doorstep almost every day, uh, revanchist Russia, rising China, uh, and among those threats and is climate change. And, uh, you know, that's the environmental considerations within defense have always been, in my view, really a bipartisan consideration, dating back 30 years ago from what I mentioned, uh, starting with considerations of how to address environmental problems during the, coast war, during the Cold War and early post-Cold War period. Uh, and there are a number of programs which John and, and the generals and admirals here were responsible for administering during their times in DOD, either to clean up military bases or comply with environmental laws. And as new challenges emerge, we approach each one uh, in its own right. And in the last two decades, it's become very clear that climate change is one of those significant threats to America's national security. Uh, and that's why 10 years ago this year, uh, when I was at CNA, we formed the Military Advisory Board uh, that General Keyes now chairs, that uh, General Galloway has served on, that Admiral Phillips is associated with, that many other leading generals and admirals um, in the armed services have been associated with to understand uh, what are the national security implications of climate change. And we've characterized that as a threat multiplier, threat multiplier for instability uh, in fragile regions of the world. Uh, and we see it. We see how our, the geostrategic posture um, is affected by climate change. Just take the Arctic. We have a whole new ocean that's been created and opened up uh, within the last decade uh, as a result of the melting of, of uh, rapid melting of sea ice in the Arctic. And now we have to begin to have more capability to operate in the Arctic in ways that we did not need to do a quarter century ago. Um, we see a potential rush for resources uh, as they are, there's more access to them, opportunities for additional fishing, navigation, transport, tourism that bring both opportunities but also risk. Um, so that's just one very poignant way in which climate change is uh, changing our world as we know it and changing how we have to position um, our armed forces to address that, as well as other capabilities. Um, second is um, important extreme weather events. Uh, we've seen that there are more extreme weather events of various types around the world and we now have to position our forces to be able to respond uh, to increased typhoons, um, increased extreme weather events, storms that might that are creating new risks, particularly within the Asia Pacific, which one might call sort of the disaster alley uh, of that of that region, where um, there there is ex extreme risk and combined with the urbanization that we see now in that area, the largest cities in the world, both uh, also people living at very low-lying areas, everywhere from uh, Bangladesh uh, to the Philippines, that are increasing risk um, when there's an extreme storm, sea level rise, um, and uh, with people who are will be need to need assistance. Uh, <clears throat> Thirdly, and I, I, want to want, I want to leave some, some time here because I, and some, some of the subject for my fellow panelists here, we see that it is also affecting our, po our military posture at home. Our installations are at risk uh, all along the Atlantic coast from a combination of sea level rise, storm surge, and uh, coastal erosion. And that is not a partisan issue. 
That's something that's affecting us. Uh, all, wherever, our, wherever our coastal military installations are located, um, and that's if we want to continue to operate, we're going to need to address the infrastructure. Today's a day that the administration is talking a lot about infrastructure. Well, we have a lot, there's a lot of infrastructure at military bases that needs to be hardened and secured against rising seas and extreme weather events. And much of this also connects then with the communities. Uh, wherever our military bases are, they are part of the community. Um, and that brings us into building more resilient communities uh, to addressing these risks because the bases are really part of the community. So in Norfolk, uh, where people can't get to the base because of nuisance flooding that occurs now on a regular basis, that's a risk for our military and it also is a risk for the community. Uh, so we see that um, these extreme weather events, storm surge, uh, increased desertification occurring around the world and drought, uh, in particular drought, we know that underlying drought was a source of conflict, um, a source of instability leading to the conflicts in both Syria uh, and in the Arab Spring uprisings. And that's now been well documented by research done by CSS and other scholars that, uh, CCS and other scholars, um, that, that we need to better understand how drought, prolonged drought, is going to be a source of instability in conflicts in the future as the world experiences more water stress and water scarcity, some of it aggravated by climate change and also by water mismanagement. Uh, so these are all um, nonpartisan, bipartisan issues. They're ones that require us to harness the capabilities across a range of government agencies. I know many of you are, you can't all be working on the Armed Services Committee, so you're working on committees um, that span a, a number of budgets and jurisdictions. You know, the research that's done across a number of agencies from NOAA to NASA to NSF, including the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, um, is all important, as well as moving our nation forward on that. We've always been leaders in the next wave of energy innovation. We have that opportunity now while caring for those um, who have to make the transition uh, from, one from fossil energy into new forms of energy. But as we make our country and our world more secure, moving along, staying at the forefront of that energy innovation curve is going to be increasingly important. We have the ability to do that. Uh, and we, are, we see that we're doing that already today, particularly in the Department of Defense, as we figure out how to power the force for the future, looking at everything from smart microgrid, microgrids to um, wind and solar to power our forward operating bases when they're at the front so they can be more resilient and operate more securely. General. Okay, so having said all that, let me answer the question. You know, if this weren't political, what would we be doing? Well, one, we'd be enjoying a renaissance of much less oversight, and that causes us problems. And number two, we probably would have more money to, to work some of these issues. But the real question is, you know, why does DOD care about this at all? Because even though we live in the communities, you know, we're just normal people, we just happen to wear a uniform in our uh, profession, we're not necessarily known as tree huggers and environmentalists and all the rest of that. But the reason we care is because there are really three things that we focus on in the military. The first thing is mission effectiveness, the ability to go and do what we have to do. We go and fight America's wars when she calls upon us to do so, and we win those wars. So we have to be able to base, we have to be able to train, we have to be able to test, mobilize, deploy, operate, reach back. We have to be able to do all of those things in the face of everything that could happen. Whether it's somebody walks out and cuts a wire, somebody throws a satchel over a fence, or whether a flood comes in, or whether sea levels rise. So we need to be able to, to do that. So it's mission effectiveness. It's about going and fighting and uh, winning. The second thing that we focus a lot on is battle space awareness. And this, I think, 
somehow confuses people that we're not focused on climate change or we're not focused on renewable energy because we put it all together. We don't break out the, each threat individually and put that in, a, in its own program element and get money for that. We look at what are the threats that impacts in, to our ability to operate, that sort of battle space awareness applied to where we base, where we train, and all the rest of the things, just like we do when we're in combat. We look at, will we have enough water? Will we have enough fuel? Will our convoy, convoys being uh, exposed? Will we have a problem with uh, weather in a certain area because of dust, uh, very fine, gritty dust? Or will we have a problem with disease and everything? So we focus on those from an intellectual and intelligence uh, focus to make sure that we know what are the threats. And then we have a term, the third thing, it's, it's called survival to operate, survive to operate. Because in our line of work, we know that we're gonna get hit. And when we get hit, we're gonna to have to still operate. It was a term that we coined back in the days when we were really concerned about chemical warfare. You had to suit up in your phase four suits and put on your mask and uh, hope that you didn't pass out from heat prostration, but that was survived to operate. We were gonna get chemmed and bioed and we were gonna to continue to fly airplanes, we're gonna to continue to fight. And you go back to the first Gulf War, you can see the pictures of people walking around in these, uh, in these suits. So survived to operate. So we have to look at, are there things that are gonna prevent us from surviving to operate? Are floods gonna cut our deployment roads or cover our runways? Are the wildfires going to knock down uh, the grid and we won't be able to get our uh, electricity? You know, on and on and on and on. So those are the three things we look at. Mission effectiveness, battle space awareness, and being able to survive to operate. Now, what do we think are kind of the, in a nutshell, what are the effects? Well, here's some of the problems that we have. The first problem is just on training. You know, the fire season has gotten longer. We've got people on the fire line. You don't want to put people on a fire line unless they're trained to be on a fire line. That is dangerous business. If they're training to be on the fire line, they're not training to be whatever it was that they came into the Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, Air Force. So that sort of training thing. If we're going to do more swift water rescue, if you've ever been involved in something like that, that is some hand-eye coordination. You've got to know what you're doing there or you will be, you will be swept away too. And as we look at the, the changes in climate, we've got, we've got airplanes that spray for uh, vectors of disease, mosquitoes, things like that. Are we gonna to have to have more of those airplanes? Are we gonna to have to have more of those crews? We've got planes that are the mobile uh, airborne firefighting system stationed out mainly in uh, Colorado. Do we need more of those airplanes? Are they gonna be engaged doing that mission much longer? What about our hurricane hunters? Do we need more of those birds? Do we need more of those crews? So we start to look at, it's a balloon. We don't think we're gonna get that many more people and that many more dollars. So if we're gonna do these kinds of things, we're gonna to have to make some hard choices. Now the other issue that you, that you have is that when you're, you're doing these, uh, these kinds of things is that you can be so involved, suppose we had a major wildfire and we're, we had a lot of stuff, and a lot of our, our National Guard is primary in these kind of reactions, and then someone decides to do something in North Korea or in Afghanistan, Iraq, name some of the dark and dusty and dangerous places around the, the world. You know, you're, you've got your force all split up. And people will think about, you know, when we talk about humanitarian crises and things like that, we tend to think about over there. We're probably fast approaching to the day when it's going to be here. If you go out, uh, you know, sometime when you're taking a trip, uh, go with your principal and go out to Kwajalein and see what Kwajalein looks like out in the west, in the ocean, and how low that thing is. Go out, the, uh, go out to Diego Garcia and look at where, that, where the water is. Go down to Langley Air Force Base at seven feet above sea level. That's where our, our raptors live. Uh, it is a you know, jewel in our, in our crown, and how it, the thing you, you've got, we analyze is you, it doesn't have to grow three feet in tidal depth. It only has to get a few 
four or five inches, and now across a bay that's four or five miles across, and the wind comes in, you've got a lot of water, and it starts to inundate. I was there in 84 commanding a fighter squadron. We had probably, over the time I was there, four or five hurricanes come through. We took a little damage, we took some water, but we changed a few things and we were good to go. I went back in 2005 as a commander of Air Combat Command, same base, and we had one nor'easter come through, just your plain, ordinary, vanilla nor'easter. We had about three or four feet of water in the main road that went outside of my, uh, my quarters. And we had people scrambling to clean grates and pump water just because in that amount of time, things had gotten that much worse when you get just a smaller storm starting from a higher base. So those are the kind of things that we, we start to look at is uh, how bad could it be? And this is the analysis that we do. You look at where you are and you go, okay, what could happen? And then you go, how bad could that be? Could we stand that? Because in some cases, we're just gonna grit our teeth. I mean, we, we train to be able to do that. But then if, you, if it's so bad we can't stand it, how much would it cost to move it back to something we can stand? And what technologically would we have to know in order to do that? And when do we start doing that technology so it's ready to implement when we get to the point that we have to have it? So it's a matter of how bad could it be? Can we stand it? If we can't stand it, is, is it affordable and, a, and accessible for us to actually change it? And then you go back to that analysis and you go, and what if we're wrong? What if it's really not happening? What if it really doesn't get that bad? How much money will we have pumped into this, these uh, things that we're planning on doing and then find out we really didn't need to do that? And where's the off ramp? Where can we stop? And we've still done something that makes us better able to operate. Our mission effectiveness is up, our battle space helps our battle space awareness uh, and helps us survive to operate. So that's the reason that uh, the military cares. Uh, because it's our job to be ready, our job to be able to, to mobilize and deploy. When, when you call us on the phone, you expect someone to pick up the other end. And some people say, well, can you give me an, an example of where a disaster has happened? They go, no, not really, not yet. That's the whole point of this, is I don't want to be standing ass deep to a, stall, a tall shrimper when you guys call and say, hey, we're up here on the top of our house, uh, you know, we would like your choppers to come uh, rescue us. I go, yeah, I'd like to do that, but you know, they're up to the skids and water them themselves. So that's the kind of forward planning that we're trying to do to make sure that we can operate. Now there's the, the other thing that I just to close with is that's here, that's kind of in the US. But as Sherry said, you know, it's a catalyst for conflict. If you don't have much water, if some places aren't gonna have as much water, they're not gonna grow as much food, there's gonna be a humanitarian crisis, there's gonna be a huge migration, and at some point, we're probably gonna get called to go help. Or there may be too much water. I've been involved uh, as the director of Ops in UCOM, and we are down in Zimbabwe, and they had floods that covered the whole country. If those become more likely, then we're gonna to have to respond to those kinds of things. So those are the kind of, not only are we getting more work, if you will, inside the, the, our United States, but we're gonna get more work outside the United States. And so now it's a matter of competing priorities. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to be? How do you want me to train? So that's the reason that we're focused on it and have been for a long time. If you go to the CCS websites, you'll see there's a long list of things go back to about 2003, which was the very first sort of official look at what is climate change going to, going to do to us. But in 1994, I was commanding Eielson Air Force Base, and we were doing uh, search and rescue exercises with Russia, Canada, and the U.S. And we were even back then talking about when these lanes start to open up. We're gonna have a lot more shipping through there. We need to, so we need to have better communications up there. We need to have better cooperation up there, and et cetera, et cetera. So we have seen this coming you know, for a long time, but it's just been painfully slow to start to focus and, and flow the money. Thank you. Jerry. Thank you. Uh, 
It's interesting. You asked the question, what would it be like if politics weren't here? And I'd say the, the military would be doing the exact same thing they're doing right now. If you go back to older field manuals, there's one uh, from the 1980s that said, weather and terrain are the most significant aspects of battlefield combat. Whether it's the runways that have to be open so you can land on them, whether it's the open seas or it's the hill you're going to climb, when they're in change, and they are in change right now, the military is concerned about that. So the military has long had an interest in dealing with things like this and forecasting what might happen. An example, during uh, World War II, as you, can, you may recall in the news, uh, we had to cross the Rhine River. And we were fortunate to secure a bridge at Remagen, which became a famous movie. But all the time that that activity was going on, they were getting ready for this dash into Germany, the military forces grouped a large number of meteorologists and climatologists and intelligence people together to determine what might the Germans do and what might nature do to make the Rhine go into flood, to change the ability of the forces to operate. It was critical to what General Eisenhower was planning to be able to understand what was going to happen on the ground. And that's what we see in so many ways when we're dealing with uh, moving forces overseas to a place we've never been at or a place where we've been to, but it is changing, will we be able to carry out the military operation? So we are very interested that the DOD, all services care about being ready so that you expect us to be able to go, we've got to be able to deliver on that. I'm an engineer, and so I've spent a lot of my time, I'd, I've done some strategy and worked about uh, what's going to happen to be the threat multiplier and the, the challenges in Bangladesh or Singapore or somewhere else where people are rushing to the cities and under climate change we may have real significant problems in dealing with these. Uh, Singapore, the sea level is rising. In that case, they're dealing with it because they recognize they have to plan 20, 30, and 50 years out in a stepwise fashion. Other countries can't do that and they'll become significant challenges for us. But are we ready? That's the real question. And there, there are three things I would talk about very quickly. One, uh, that General Keyes has already mentioned the entire issue of training. We, training is at the heart of what the military does. And if our bases are not capable of providing the platform for the training we need, then we're not gonna be as ready as we should be. Uh, we've already seen the challenges. It goes back to as far as the red cockaded woodpecker at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, that stopped training in many areas. We've stopped training in, in parts of the National Training Center for various animals that are there that are on the endangered species list. As the temperature rises with climate change, it will cause major significant movements in where we're going to have to deal with these sorts of issues, and we'll have to address them. That's the way we do. Our country is responsive to that. Uh, we're going to have to look at uh, what is the temperature going to do to the ability of our troops to train. You can only train outside a certain period of time. And when the temperature gets above a certain level, we shut it down. All of those things have to be taken into account as you move forward. The other issues that come up are how do we test the equipment for the future? We have to come up with new methods of uh, acquisition of material that we're going to need. Uh, the trucks that we use now, the combat vehicles we use, the ships and the, the planes, all have to be prepared to operate in this different environment. Uh, my experience in Vietnam with dust was, uh, it was terrible. Our helicopters are very wonderful, but you put them down consistently in dust, just as you did in Iraq or you do now in Afghanistan, and you create severe problems. If you're operating in environments where the temperatures are very much different than they were when you planned to operate there, then you can't get the helicopters to go to certain elevations. You can't do other things that make your operation move smoothly. So we've got to think about what equipment will we require in the future? How will we test it? Uh, do you want us to be ready to go? We can't use, people are saying, fighting the last war. You can't operate with the last war's equipment when the world around you is changing. So it is important that the military consider what is on the horizon and what are we going to do about that horizon. Uh, if we have to land in the Pacific, we've had a, a look at the Pacific. Uh, Sherry has mentioned the entire issue of uh, operating on islands in, in the Pacific, Kwajalein. As sea level rises, subsidence occurs in places, can we still land where we used to be able to land? And will our vessels, when the seas are more intense, will they be able to move ashore, the landing craft that have to move our supplies in? So we have to think through all of these, and you would expect them to do that. And that's why I say this kind of thinking is going on at the highest levels all the time. Uh, it is only when there is interference in the thinking, people say, don't do it, uh, don't think this way, 
uh, it's really not happening, that the military begins to push back a little bit and say, no, we have to be ready for these eventualities. It's terribly important that we do that. There's the last one that is kind of interesting because we don't hardly think of it. Um, we don't live just on military installations. We get supplies from all over the world. We, you can recall in 2011 when the, the area north of Bangkok, Thailand, uh, an area of great industrial power where they were manufacturing parts and all sorts of systems that were being used, we discovered later, in systems in the United States. If that area is underwater, we can't get the supplies for just-in-time manufacturing. We have to be aware of those sorts of things. Uh, last year, you may recall, there was flooding in, in South and North Carolina. Interstate 95 was shut down for a week for about 30 miles. You can't move large amounts of material when you need to when the, the roads are underwater. Are we prepared for that? Our military installations have ties to the neighboring communities, the lifelines, whether it's the power, or it's the water, or it's the roads. Are they all working together to get us to the right uh, approach when the time comes that we have one of these major events? You've seen the, the quote, thousand year floods. You've seen the uh, disastrous storms that we have on our coast. All of those, have to, we have to be ready for those. And that's what the military is trying to do, to look ahead to see what is it that we're dealing with and can we in fact be ready for the future? And can we, in our installations especially, do it in coordination with our civilian neighbors? Uh, in our study on the Gulf, uh, or on the Gulf and East Coast uh, communities tied into the military, we found that there are interesting challenges in every one of them because we now have military personnel living off post that have to get on post. We have workers that man key installation uh, facilities that we need to have get to the post. Uh, we, again, need them to support what we're doing and we need to support what they're doing as we adaptively deal with climate change. And that doesn't mean always we're gonna build a wall, we're gonna build levees, we're gonna build breakwaters. We're gonna go for natural systems. We're gonna find new ways to do it. Your military is at the forefront of dealing with some of these challenges. And again, it comes back to, we're not gonna be any different whether there's politics or not because the military is focused on having a military that's ready to move and in order to do that, we have to think through the hazards that we're gonna face, the risks that are created by those hazards, and then the strategies that we're gonna use. And I'll stop at that. Admiral. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, thank you to Mr. Conger for uh, your kind introduction, and thanks to all of you for, uh, for tolerating a really tight room. We're glad to see such a tremendous response. Um, as Mr. Conger mentioned, I'm a surface warfare officer. I drove ships for 31 years, and like my military peers here today on an active duty around the world, I'm an operator. I'm trained to view a mission in strategical, strategic, operational, and tactical terms, do what's required with clear-eyed pragmatism to prepare for and execute that mission. I don't do it with any sort of political focus whatsoever. I have a job, and I know how to do the job. DOD has a long history, in fact, of taking climate impact seriously because they create and intensify operational risk and global instability, as the other panelists have mentioned this morning, this afternoon. This is a real threat. It's not an imagined threat based on a political agenda. We in the Department, Defense Department have an inherent oper a responsibility to prepare to execute our mission. That responsibility drives serious consideration for climate change because we are seeing more and more of the impacts of it in our daily lives as we execute our mission and prepare for it here at home and also as we operate overseas. And finally, climate change adaptation requires a whole of government approach and the defense community needs the opportunity to execute, as General Keyes uh, implied, um, without a constant shifting of perspectives, words, strategies, um, impediments to be able to execute its mission. We know what we need to do. We know what we're faced with. Allow us to plan, evaluate risk, prepare, and operate. We have a national security mission to fulfill, after all. The challenge is particularly acute, as some of you have heard uh, mentioned today, in our coastal military installations, and no more, more so than in Hampton Roads, where I live. Hampton Roads is a region on the front lines of climate impact right now. We are experiencing sea level rise at twice the rate of other East Coast locations, second only to New Orleans in the degree of, of change that we are seeing, because we're also dealing with land subsidence that is unique to the Hampton Roads area. 
This is a serious and growing threat, not only to regional military readiness, but to national military readiness. Why? Because there are almost 29 separate federal entities within the Hampton Roads region spread across nearly 100 distinct facilities. Of these, the largest percentage, nearly two-thirds, are Department of Defense facilities, and two-thirds of those are Navy facilities, including unique national assets like Naval Station Norfolk, arguably the largest naval station in the world, Newport News Naval Shipyard, our only aircraft carrier construction and refueling facility, and one of only two submarine construction facilities in the country. In addition, as General Keyes has mentioned, the Air Force Combat Command, Army Training and Doctrine Command, major Army logistics bases, special operations forces, and key training facilities for those commands, the largest NATO command outside of Europe, Supreme Allied Command for Transformation, is in Norfolk, Virginia, Jefferson Labs, NASA Langley, and oh, by the way, we're the fourth largest commercial port on the East Coast, gateway to the Chesapeake Bay, all of which helps to support not only the economy of the country, the economy of Virginia, but the military and federal facilities that reside in the Hampton Roads region. 45% of our regional uh, economic development is based on the presence of federal facilities, as well as critical infrastructure. So it impacts, as you've heard, the whole community, the whole region is, is impacted by what's happening here and its ability to support the, the military. 65% of the 1.7 million people who live in Hampton Roads 17 cities and municipalities travel to another city to work. So resilience and adaptation can't be limited to just protecting a base or a facility or a city. It has to be done across a whole of government and community within the region. In my ongoing work in the region, I often encounter people who cannot wait to tell me about their experiences with water. I'll share a few of those with you. A NATO colonel and his wife I met at a Christmas party. As soon as she found out I worked on sea level rise, she couldn't wait to spend the next 30 minutes telling me about life in Hampton Roads dealing with water. She had to learn to drive a four-wheel drive vehicle. She had to learn to think about what the storms, the weather, the tides were going to be to get in and out of her community. She had to learn different ways to get places that she needed to go to be able just to go to the store, pick up her husband at work, execute her daily life in Hampton Roads region. There are people who I, I know in Virginia Beach who have to decide what vehicle to take to work and when they're going to leave based on the tide cycle. And when the, while this used to be only limited to significant storms, now this can happen anytime. If the wind's blowing the right way, we've got sunny day flooding, and you have to change your plan. You have to operate differently in your life. I know a retired military couple who live in a very prominent Norfolk neighborhood who openly discuss their concern that they will have to abandon their home because of the constant flooding that makes it difficult to get in and out of their neighborhood, even though it doesn't directly impact their house. So we are dealing with this on a routine basis. People change their lives every day in Hampton Roads just to be able to execute whatever it is that they need to do. And many of those people, many, are involved in supporting the military in some way, shape, or form, and they are the families of service members who are stationed in the region. So in discussing the national security implications of climate change, you can see that Hampton Roads is really a crucible for the entire range of changes between the large number of federal and DOD facilities and the fact that we are now constantly dealing with water in places we don't want, need, or expect it on a more, ever more routine basis. We are really dealing with challenges at our present, and we know we'll have to deal with them into our future. Within that context, the Department of Defense believes it has an inherent responsibility to prepare. They take this very seriously, and they've got to have the ability to plan, implement, interact with the lo local community, share data in an open manner so that we can plan regionally to not only support our local and regional missions, but to execute our national security strategy. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to sort of sum up uh, the answer to the question that I posed, which was, uh, is, the, is there what amount of this is politics and what amount of this would happen regardless of politics? And it sounds like DOD would have to pay attention to climate change regardless of politics, and they were going to regardless of politics. There are things that are going to happen, and there's two main categories that I heard discussed. One is, one is on mission and another one's on infrastructure. And let's do a couple of questions on, on each one and let the panel talk about them. First, let's start with mission. Um, if we go back to the, the Mattis quote, 
uh, and where he says, I agree that the effects of a changing climate impact our security situation. C can um, maybe have a couple of comments about things that are going on today that are exacerbated, not caused, but exacerbated by climate so that uh, our folks in the field have to actually pay attention to what's going on uh, uh, with regard to the uh, changing climate, uh, sea levels, et cetera, uh, that affect their preparation for their job, what they have to train for out there in the field t today. I know there's a lot of discussion of, uh, of Syria and whether drought has exacerbated that situation. Uh, Sherry, you talked a little bit about the Arctic. Uh, how could that change our future mission profiles as the ice melts up there? Uh, does anybody want to take a whack at, at that and focus on, the, on that piece of the puzzle? Well, I think the easy one is, if there is an easy one, is the Arctic. We know what the problems are in the Arctic. As the Arctic opens up, you have more people up there, so now you're going to have, you have more opportunity for one mischief, accidents, et cetera, et cetera. But when you go north, some of the big problems you have is we don't have a good picture of the north like we do on most of the rest of the globe. So having those kind of intelligence surveillance reconnaissance assets up there so you know what's going on, so the Coast Guard can see what's happening. Second thing is communications are bad at the top of the world. So you've got to make sure that you're, you have the capability so now when something does happen, someone gets notified so someone can go out and fix stuff. So that's sort of a an approach to, okay, what will we have to do when you can no longer walk across uh, the North Pole, but you can sail across the North Pole? That makes a, a big uh, difference. Another thing is, of course, I think, uh, and Jerry can probably talk better about this than I can, but it's just a matter of water. If people don't have enough water, then you, when you send your troops in there, they're not going to they're not going to quickly dig a well and find water either. So it's a matter: of how do you make water? How do you reclaim water? How do you make sure the water is pure enough to use? How do you carry enough water? Do you go in with uh, pallets of plastic bottles, or do you go in with a couple of canteens? Do you have the water buffaloes, the big? Uh, apparatus that we use to move water around. Can you go in and, and use your desalinization or you can use some of the other systems that we have to actually reclaim, uh, uh, reclaim water? So I think that's a, an issue as we get into some of these, uh, some of these areas. In other areas, uh, from an Air Force standpoint, we have looked at the, the issue of where can, we, where can we base? Are the bases going to be tenable? because that's a big deal for us. You've got to have a long piece of concrete in order to get in and uh, operate. Otherwise, you're operating at great range. And so in some cases, they may be underwater. In other cases, it may be too dry. They're too dusty. We can't operate. It's untenable. So those are the kind of things that we're looking at uh, from an uh, Air Force standpoint. Uh, just to add on to what General Keyes has already mentioned, you know, the in addition, in the Arctic, the permafrost is shrinking very rapidly now uh, to the point that we are looking at having to relocate a number of Arctic villages, Alaskan villages, uh, because of a combination of uh, sinking permafrost, uh, coastal erosion, and rising seas. Uh, in, a, in addition, uh, you know, there, there's new opportunities for energy exploration, uh, which is going to bring, um, bring risk and potential reward. We're going to see operation along the right. You know, the U.S. and Russia are only about 30 miles apart at their closest point uh, in the Bering Straits, uh, which until recent years was, was navigable only for a very brief period of the year and was used primarily just to refuel um, and restock villages uh, up at the top of the world. But now, you, we, we saw even last year a Chinese LNG tanker make the, the trip uh, through uh, across the Russian Northwest Passage and down the Bering Straits. I think this is just the beginning um, of what will be much more ship traffic in that, in that area for a variety of reasons. Last year, there was a 4,000, a multi-thousand passenger cruise ship called the Crystal Serenity that fortunately sailed without incident uh, throughout the Canadian Northwest Passage uh, and in the uh, U.S. and American Arctic and is planned to travel again this summer. In my view, it's only going to be a matter of time 
uh, before there is some incident that requires a significant search and rescue uh, or oil spill response. Uh, our Coast Guard, along with associated um, military, guard, and other forces, are already planning and preparing for such eventualities. Uh, and as a result, we're looking at buying not only new icebreakers for our aging icebreaker fleet, but additional types of communication, uh, maritime domain awareness uh, capabilities, potentially even a deep water port uh, up in that region, um, which the U.S. has, has never had. Uh, and so really the, this region of the world is, is changing more rapidly than anyone anywhere else uh, on the planet now, and it uh, is putting the U.S. and other nations in the world, and not only Arctic nations, because every, countries from China to Singapore to Spain see new opportunities uh, to uh, obtain either the energy, the fish, the tourist, tourism, uh, or other, um, other opportunities that will be there. In that, in that region. And that will bring, as I said, both significant risk, which today we're not, re we're not really prepared uh, to address. And that will, will, is forcing us to sort of shift how we look at those pr at priorities for that region compared to other places we need to have force available uh, throughout the world. So, um, so that's sort of the, 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 the overview on mission, and we can get to, to more questions on that in a little bit. But so clearly, DoD needs to plan in advance um, for for missions that they're going to have to fulfill, and as as the world changes, there are going to be new missions that they have to think about. From a from a fixed infrastructure perspective, the world the, we're in a, a given location, and the world is changing around us, and is going to affect those things that we can't move, not or at least not easily. Um, there. Uh, General Keyes and General Galloway, you just uh, recently finished a report on sea level rise uh, for, for CCS. Do you, do, could you summarize the findings of the report uh, briefly? I would say that uh, the challenge we identified is that we are seeing coastal erosion, we are seeing the sea level rise, and we're seeing the challenge of increased numbers of uh, large storms that are causing problems. In addition, if you happen to be a place like Norfolk where there's subsidence, uh, the water is rising and the land is going down, you create all sorts of problems. So the, there's the physical issue of how do you deal with that? And, uh, and the defense structure, the Army Corps of Engineers and the other agencies of the government are looking at are there ways besides putting concrete out to deal with that because it's very expensive and may not last very long. So that's a challenge. The other challenge is to recognize uh, that this is going to be phased over time and to develop a plan to deal with this. Consider what the challenges are, forecast what your risks are over time, and then develop the plan that says, I'm going to get to this step when I need to, this step when I need to, but be prepared to change as all of these conditions can change on these coastal areas. Uh, what's of interest to me in talking about the infrastructure, it's not just our infrastructure that we are worried about. We're worried about the infrastructure of our partner nations. We use their bases. We have hundreds of bases overseas where we rely on somebody else to, to give us the support or we expect them to handle their particular problems and we'll come in to back them up. Uh, when they have these same sorts of problems on the coastal areas especially, you create uh, even more problems. So there, it, the challenge becomes one of, we have these bases, we need to do something about them. Will we develop a plan that will let us get from here to 2020, then 2040, 2050, and have them remain as they are needed, remain able to carry out the missions that are currently assigned? And that's going to take a lot of planning. It's going to take a lot of resources eventually to do that. Not everything today, but over a period of time, we have to have a program, and that, that developing that strategy is going to be critical. Admiral, uh, you recently sat uh, and chaired a, a working group on uh, 
the, the intergovernmental uh, relationships when you have sea level rise near, near Hampton Roads? The, how, does the, how do the local municipalities deal with the bases? How do the bases deal with the municipalities? Can you characterize how this particular sea level rise and subsidence issue is driving uh, requirements? What, are the, what do folks actually need to communicate to each other? How much planning needs to be done jointly? And is it just in, I mean, Hampton Roads is, is sort of like the front line of, of this issue, but there are other places where municipalities need to talk to the bases and have, frankly, on other issues mm -hmm. for, for a long time. What, what are the kinds of things that need to be going back and forth in communication between those two? Well, I think the first thing is, is understanding uh, common common standards. Uh, as an example, if uh, the Defense Department is going to plan uh, to adapt uh, to sea level rise implications in the Hampton Roads region over the next period of time, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, what sea level rise scenario curve are they using to make those plans? And how does that compare with what the cities are looking at and what the cities are thinking? If they aren't using and planning to a, th the same standard, then, then they aren't ever going to really meet in the middle and we could miss dependencies and interdependencies where we're going to find that you know, infrastructure, roads, highways, um, utilities uh, will need to be upgraded based on one set of circumstances, but if the city is using a lower uh, sea level rise scenario curve, as an example, meaning there won't be as much water at the same time, um, then, then they, won't be as, they won't be prepared, they won't be ready. So shared common standards is important. Uh, there are also, even though there are many opportunities for the, for the federal facilities and for the local communities to engage with each other, we found that there were not a lot of actually structured ways in which that takes place. Um, there, 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 weren't a, there don't appear to be a lot of um, you know, detailed planning, uh, infrastructure updates, meetings, um, memorandums of understanding where they would be sharing information with each other on a routine basis. Um, that was actually kind of puzzling and we, we had in our, in our working group, um, just by chance, the stormwater engineers from, from Little Creek uh, Joint Expeditionary Base Little Creek, the cities of Norfolk and Virginia Beach, which are the two cities that surround that area, had actually never met. And during the course of the working group, they were all in the room together. They actually were able to meet, share data that they'd wanted from each other for 20 years, but they couldn't figure out how to get it. So the challenge is, of course, 20 years ago, the need wasn't what it is today. So we are seeing some, you know, now that there's a greater need, there's a greater interest in more established, more routine, uh, policies, plans, procedures, so that the, the cities and the, and the uh, uh, federal facilities can actually share and, and plan together. The other challenge, of course, is budgets. Um, the federal government's budget system does not align with what the cities are using. It doesn't align with the state budget particularly. So uh, the challenge of making all those things fit together to be able to plan to actually execute things where perhaps joint coordination is required, that's difficult. And then I think the last thing I would say is um, when you look at, you know, the way we deal with flood planning in this country, a flood insurance rate map system, um, and the way we determine, you know, what what is critical infrastructure, uh, and and how you know how far above uh, base flood elevation do you raise a building if it's critical or if it's not critical? Well, all that is based on historical data and what you expect to happen right now, this year, today. We have to change how we think about that because we're planning 50 years into the future. You don't want to build a building 50 years into the future saying that's going to have that lifespan and say, hmm, let's build it. It's critical infrastructure. Let's build it three, year, three feet above the base flood elevation that we have today. Because in 50 years, that's going to be a different base flood elevation and your building may not be functional. So that's a paradigm shift in the way that we think and plan. Um, very little flood planning. And oh, by the way, it doesn't just go up. It goes out. Uh, considers future predictions. And, and until we figure out, and this is not just the federal uh, DOD issue, this is, a, this is an everybody issue, um, how to prepare for that, we're going to be challenged to plan appropriately and to collaborate on planning. So um, what makes Hampton Roads so interesting is there's so many cities and so many facilities that are all together that all have to collaborate. So it's, uh, it's fascinating and, and it will be a great challenge for the future. So before we go to questions from the audience, I actually have somebody who handed me a piece of paper with a question from the audience. So since they had the forethought to do that, they get to go first. Um, uh, the, the, the question was, what, what is the, uh, along the same lines here, talking about adaptation in the infrastructure, what is the impact of uh, the president's uh, executive orders or appealing of the executive orders on, on the military? So can, does anybody have any comments on, say, for example, I, I 
I recall the, the adaptation executive order w was repealed. Um, are, are there specific impacts that are going to come from that? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I would say I, I wouldn't think so unless something happens here. I mean, a lot of the pushback we get becomes political and someone says, you can't spend money on that. On the other hand, the military has been very effective, I think, saying we're, we're not spending this on climate change, we're not spending this on renewable energy, we're, we're spending this on missing effectiveness. It's very hard for someone to come into a commander and say, you can't spend this money to make your base more resilient. You can't sp spend this money on your port in order to make you more effective. And so I think, I mean, one of the things that we do not like in the military is we get these edicts that come in because we can have, you know, people can send us edicts and says you have to do X. And generally, it's an unfunded mandate. So we don't like unfunded mandates. People come in and say you have to do this. And you're, and you're looking and you go, where's the check that's attached to this? There is none. And so we have to take very precious money from something else in order to do uh, the mandate. So I, I don't see that as a, you know, we are too far down the road. We understand this at a very granular uh, level, and we can make the case that if you don't do this, this is going to be the effect. We won't be able to fly. We won't be able to mobilize. We won't be able to test or whatever it is. If you go down to Eglin and you look at the blockhouses that are out on the beach that we have all of our very valuable telemetry in, that we do all of this very high-end testing, and you can see how undercut they are by the... Uh, coastal flooding from storms that before would never even reach halfway up the, the uh, beach, then you understand we've got to spend money here or we're, we're going to lose millions, hundreds of millions. So I don't think that's a, from my perspective and my experience has been is that it makes sense, it's a pragmatic, practical kind of thing. It's not Democrat, it's not Republican, it's not liberal, it's not conservative, it's climate. It's Mother Nature. Mother Nature doesn't belong to a party. She just trundles, on, trundles along. Uh, to, but to go to the executive order itself, the, it, this is tied into the federal flood risk management standard that was promulgated by the last administration two years ago. Uh, it is clear that everything we've talked about, being ready for the future, takes that into account. Just as you said, if, if you are rebuilding, and it's focused on rebuilding with federal funds after a disaster, the money should go into putting you not back where you were, but where you may be in the future. And by the way, we just spent $15 billion in New Orleans to rebuild the levees with the target height of the levee focused on the 2053 elevation, not the 2015 elevation. Makes a lot of sense. Why? put yourself in the hole the day after you finish the project. And so the, I believe that the people thinking about the infrastructure program that we'll see in the next uh, week or the next two weeks recognize that if you're going to build, build for the future and not for today. And my hope is that uh, we will continue on the path of this federal flood risk management standard. It's like a, a do-over on that too, because I know some folks that work in the insurance industry and work in the insuring of insurance companies in that, in that space. And I, I frankly think this is going to be commercially driven because you're not going to be able to get any kinds of uh, insurance. It's like the folks down in Miami. Miami has looked at this and said, holy smokes, if you've been down on the strand down there in, uh, in Miami, you know, the road is fairly close just behind the beach, and it's pretty cool. And they built that, they started building that raising the road and they have these little uh, suitable system of linkage and levers that uh, allow the water not to wash up. It stops the water, but then water will come out. But then when the water gets so high out on, in the ocean, that one-way valve doesn't go either way and it stops. So now all the rain dams up behind it. So the people that have all these nice houses on the other side of the road, they can't get insurance because their first floor is now classified as a basement. So there's all that sort of you know, unintended consequences, but it's commercially driven. If you can't, you know, if, if you're not going to be able to get insurance, then you'll think twice about going to your insurance company and saying, well, how could I get insurance? Can I build to a different, can I, even if I'm not mandated federally, can I do something so I can protect myself from a catastrophic loss? And so I, 
I think that some of these things that other commercial interests are going to weigh in on this and more or less force us to do, uh, force us to do the right thing without governmental rules and, and uh, regulations. So, so I'd like to get a couple questions from uh, the audience, if we could. We have a room full of staffers. I'd really be interested in hearing what people are, are in fact, interested in. And we've got about 20 m more minutes left. We have a wandering mic going around. Um, and if you could wait before you uh, ask your question until you get the mic, just so that we have it fed into the, uh, uh, the tape, uh, the, the video. So there's the mic. Does anybody have any questions? Don't worry, I have a page full. If nobody wants to raise their hand and be on television, I'll keep going. Do we have any? Hello. Uh, okay. uh, we got at least one there. So uh, first off, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today and answer the questions that were presented. And in regards to my own question, uh, the, the idea of mitigation, risk mitigation as a whole, kind of focus on adaptation, uh, infrastructure planning, uh, forethought in that realm. But in terms of mig mitigating the impact that humans might have on climate change, is that also just a, a language aspect with the current administration and past administrations of not trying to create barriers to what you can do internally? Or what is the, the lack of kind of talk on uh, mitigating the military's impact on the environment? So you're talking about emissions at this point, yeah. right? Well, uh, let, let, me, let me do like 30 seconds, even as the moderator, I'm gonna answer a little bit because I, I was, uh, you know, sort of, I, I ran the installations and environment office when we were getting the, the greenhouse gas requirements down on us. And we still thought about the problem, like it was about energy efficiency was about money, not about emissions. Uh, renewable energy projects were about resilience and savings, frankly, uh, and not about uh, lowering emissions. That was, those were good benefits to have as well, but it wasn't why we were doing what we were doing. Uh, did anybody else have any uh, thoughts that they wanted to add? Yeah, I would just say, you know, when you get to mitigation, here's, here's the thing you have to understand, and I hope everybody will take this one to heart, because you may have heard this old saw that goes around and says, the Department of Defense is the largest single user of energy in the United States, right? You heard that, right? The percentage of that, in order to be the largest single user, is 1.7 percent of all energy that's used in the United States. We run on equivalent of about 350,000 barrels, I think it is, a day, versus, you know, the big U.S. is run on, what, 20 million barrels a day, or pick a number, but it's a lot bigger. So if the DOD goes out of business tomorrow, we really don't move the needle on mitigation. I mean, our contribution, now we're gonna try and be good stewards, we're gonna try and you know, fly our airplanes and, and sail our ships uh, very efficiently, or we're gonna use alternative uh, non-polluting fuel where it's possible, or we're gonna do all of those things because it makes mission sense and budget sense for us, but this is one of these things that we can't win this war. We can show why it's important and why we believe in it, et cetera, but we're not gonna be able to win this one because we just don't have the market throw. We don't have the volume to make it happen. So from a mitigation standpoint, that's gonna be very, I mean, we will do what we can do and we'll do, do the right thing, but that's not gonna fix it because you're still gonna have 98% of the budget that needs to be fixed. That said, and I, I agree with General Keyes on that point, um, when the military lowers its carbon boot print, so to speak, um, it's also able to provide, to provide leadership as it has in other technologies and innovation uh, throughout, you know, throughout the years. Uh, in the transition, if you go back in the transition from steam to coal, uh, to oil, to nuclear, uh, all forms of energy, the United States military was at the forefront of leading those massive shit transitions in energy. Today, the U.S. military, while not alone, is among those leading in that transition to diversifying its energy mix. Uh, of course, it's going to continue to operate on forms of fossil energy for the foreseeable future. 
Uh, that said, when I was in the Department of Defense, the way that um, we budgeted for oil, it was essentially a tax on the rest of the defense budget. It would come in at the end of the year after the services, the Army, Navy, Air Force, everybody else built their budget to do whatever they needed. And then if the price of fuel had gone up that year, then it was an extra cost on the military. So there was, in some ways, there's a direct incentive to be more fuel efficient because then you can use those funds for military readiness, training, other operations, equipment. Um, and at the same time, being more innovative, being more efficient, um, in, improves security of energy security and energy resilience. Um, that's, that's why, um, you know, Secretary of Defense Mattis, uh, when he was commanding our forces in Iraq, uh, famously said, uh, unleash us from the tether of fuel. Uh, that didn't necessarily mean unleash us completely from fossil energy, but unleash us from the long supply lines that are putting our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, at risk in convoying fuel to the front. And in those 10 years since he made those comments, uh, the military has gotten very busy diversifying and innovating uh, in being able to reduce the burden on our forces of those long logistic supply lines. Uh, I would add to that that the military has set the example in our relations with our partners overseas. They are very impressed by what the U.S. military has done, and they, they are following it. So words do matter. Uh, and, and my personal opinion is there's such a thing as a, a climate that's created. The climate right now is when you go overseas or you go to a, an installation or people come here from other countries, they say, you're, you're with it. Uh, the question will be, will they draw some other conclusion even if we continue the pace but take a different uh, public stance on it. So I think it's important, uh, the MAB has said in its two previous reports, the United States must take a leadership position in dealing with climate change across the board. And so I, I don't think we ought to forget that. Uh, even though we are going to pursue, I would argue that the military will pursue uh, active uh, actions, but will at the same time be guiding and listening to and talking to our allies. All right, do we have another question? Uh, do you have the mic? Thank you for speaking with us. Um, I have a quick question about um, the relationship between Congress and the DOD. Um, so are there particular things that Congress can do outside of the allocation of funding to um, help the DOD in mitigating some of the risks you guys have spoken about today? Does anybody want to take that? How can well, Congress be helpful? You know, I think, you know, that's probably the, one of the highlights is the fact that Congress will invite members of DOD to come over and sit down and talk. Now, we would prefer to talk in an office call. Open testimony does not enthrall me. And I don't think, my, I don't think most people are enthralled with open testimony because all of you understand it's high theater sometimes. But we need to get down to where we can talk about why we're doing what we're doing, why we believe it's the right thing to do, and have that pragmatic discussion around the table rather than jockeying for position or having a mic thrust in front of us so now we're on the, on the news. You know, that, that's just not useful. And I think, uh, generally speaking, the folks on the Armed Services Committee that I dealt with back in the day, uh, that's where we get our, our work done. So I think that, ask us why we, ask DOD, why do you do this? It's not because we think it's something cool to do. I mean, we're pretty busy, so we really don't have time to do cool stuff. We have got to do stuff that's focused on mission effectiveness. And, we would be, and I think everyone would be happy to explain that, say this is why we're doing it, this is why we need to do it. If you need to take the uh, peers down in Norfolk and you need to build them higher, that's a discussion we should, we should be able to have. It's one of those things, you know, the unthinkable happen even if you don't think about it. So we need to think about it, and we need to talk about it. Nothing should be able, you shouldn't be able, someone shouldn't be able to say, I don't want you talking about that. That's not good, because we're not sharing the information that we both have. And so I think that's important. I I, I would, this kind of gets back to the executive order question, too. and, and uh, 
The challenge is with the rescission of the executive order, what does that impose within the, within the Department of Defense's mind? Doubt. Right. What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? Does this mean the things that I had planned that, are, that were mitigating or uh, resiliency uh, strategies or, or infrastructure corrections, changes, upgrades, modifications, I can't do them now? Does this mean I can't use certain words? Does this mean I can't uh, execute plans that I already had in place? The, the doubt is the problem. And right now, um, there is some doubt because there's concern that if the military speaks openly about what it's trying to do and why it's trying to do it, it will be told to stop. That's bad. We don't want that to happen. So what we really need, well, I think what the Defense Department would be, would appreciate from Congress is the opportunity to have that conversation and the opportunity to say, here's why I need to do this and here's what I'm doing it to prepare for and be straightforward about it and, and that it's, this is an impact to our, our national security and we have to prepare for it at the end. So, so the, the, the implication, I just wanted to throw a clarifying note out there. Um, so the, clarif uh, the implication is, is that if Congress was to be clear that DOD can go about its normal resilience and adaptation um, plans and execute those, that, that that has nothing to do with the political discussion that's going on yes. uh, here. The, the other resiliency thing I, and adaptation planning is critical to future preparation to execute our mission. And doing it right is important. Uh, it would be interesting to, to ask the members uh, how many of them had had the opportunity to talk about the relationship between the bases and the military uh, or the people that live off post and what they've done to think about climate change together. What are the adaptation steps they have to take together? Uh, I've met people that have spent a lot of time with their members and others where the, the just as you've said about even on our own military installation not meeting everybody, where we don't have the two working together and the Congress can be a great uh, spur to having that uh, sort of joint effort to look at the future. All right, I think we have time for, based on the length of these answers, one more question. I see a hand up in the back. Uh, can, the mic can get up over there. Hi, thank you all for coming here today and speaking with us. Uh, my main question is, you talked a lot about the effects that we're seeing with the linkage between climate change um, and rising sea levels. I was wondering what kind of effects are we seeing away from those coastal areas, more in the mid range where you're not as close to rivers or lakes? Thank you. Everybody's close to a river, I'll tell you that, as we've learned. Uh, and, and we are seeing challenges right now across the nation uh, with uh, the effects of larger storms and when they come more intense storms. All you have to do is go to Houston or Baton Rouge or other cities in this country where there are problems. That same thing can happen at the military installation. So what heretofore had not been a problem has now become a big problem. And, and we're working on, as I mentioned, in the, or was said in the introduction, I'm working on the challenge of urban flooding in the United States, which is hardly ever seen because it doesn't last for more than two or three days, just gets your house wet. But if you're very poor, uh, you have a very difficult time. The same thing if you have older barracks at military installations and you get these intense rainfall events, or we've talked about the temperature rise uh, you, you have in, in places in the United States, it's just too hot to train. Well, that's a problem for it. So it's not just coastal. It, it, there's all sorts of things, including where we've, we don't have these great concrete runways. Uh, asphalt uh, on roads and runways uh, in, in, in intense heat can be uh, certainly a problem when you get the temperature too high. There were, in addition, I worked on a pilot project in, in Hampton Roads region, which you've heard. There were, in addition to that, two other DOD pilots. One was in Mountain Home uh, Air Force Base, and the other was a Michigan Army and Air National Guard. Both of those pilots were largely focused on drought, fire issues, to some extent flash flooding, but a whole different set of circumstances than, than sea level rise and recurrent flooding. So, uh, t you know, three very different regions, three very different challenges, all climate driven. That just reminded me that you know, Mountain Home was one of my bases. One of the big issues with Mountain Home is the aquifer is drying up. And how do we get water, you know, then it goes through this kabuki dance of how to get water out of the Snake River and get it to Mountain Home because it's a great place, it's got great capability, but the issue there is not enough water and that's one of those non-refilling uh, aquifers. And so you start looking around, and in fact, OSD and the services are looking, surveying the basis, saying where is water going to be a problem? You know, the closer you get to the bay, to the 
coast, then you start to have saltwater intrusion, and, that, and that's a whole other set of uh, problems. And in some of the highlands, you end up, you're just not going to have enough water. How do we protect uh, that capability? And then you start looking at, you know, from a national standpoint, in some areas we got way too much water in some of the rivers, and some of the rivers we haven't got enough water, And but that was the water we were planning on generating electricity with. And so it's all of that kind of, we got to start looking at those kind of things. And again, it goes back to how bad could it be? Could we stand that? Technically and dollar-wise, what could we do to get this back to something that'll, that, that uh, will work? And when do we have to start? And how do we know we're making progress? And then you always ask the question, what if we're wrong? Because we don't, you know, we don't have enough money to waste. We need to have a plan that's adaptable and we can, we can look ahead. And I think the as Sherry has said, you know that we have spent a lot of a lot of brain power looking at this. I think we're a pretty pretty good example of how to look at this and think about how to how to move ahead. Because it's, I remember saying uh, when we were working on uh, renewable energy, uh, particularly for fossil fuel, uh, that doesn't solve our problem. Because if you got to get 500 miles deep to refill your tank. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're carrying a biofuel or a fossil fuel, you still got to get 500 miles deep. But I was trying to explain to people why we were interested in this. I said, look, no commander wants to write a letter home, you know, dear Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I was so enthralled with renewable energy that I got your son or daughter into the valley of death and ran them out of fuel and they're dead. I mean, that's not, we don't want that. Uh, by the same token, I don't want to write that letter and saying, I didn't focus enough on fuel availability, and I got your son or daughter into the valley of death, and I got them killed. And so that, that's a serious kind of, when we look at this stuff, this is, this is not sort of academic. These are real people shedding real blood in faraway places, and we've got to make sure that we've got the capability to keep them as absolutely as well equipped, well led, and as well protected as we possibly can. All right, we've got like three minutes left. I see a little hand peeking up there. If it's a short question, we can do this. Um, you've, you've touched a bunch on this, but uh, so given the projected budget and the projected agenda, do you feel like you'll be able to accomplish what you need to? Um, to secure mission operations, et cetera, awareness, training? Um, or do you feel like um, that agenda or, or budget may, may, may hamper you in certain ways? So before anybody answers, let me clarify that nobody here is in the Department of Defense right now, and, and it might be a, a challenge to answer that question, but if anybody wants to take a whack at it, they can. Uh, all right, I'll go ahead and, and, and oh, if you want to go, go. It's a, it's a good question, and the, the challenge right now is that there's a lot of uncertainty in the system about the extent to which the planning, the responsible uh, planning preparation for resilience, um, for adaptation, um, it vary from training to operations to installations can continue to go, can continue to, to go forward. Um, and that's because of the actions, you know, of, re of recent weeks. And so it's important. I mean, I think Secretary Mattis's statements on the record are very important, um, but it needs to follow through throughout, you know, it needs to be communicated throughout the Defense Department. It needs to be heard here on Capitol Hill. Um, it was reflected in the statements um, by the new Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coase, when he was up here on the Hill testifying not long ago about in recognizing climate change as a threat, but it needs to continue to be heard at all levels of command and in all parts of the services uh, and throughout the U.S. government, really, so that the agencies that have been doing the work um, and the universities and the others that have been supporting that work can continue um, to can continue to plan in a responsible way and protect the American people. So, so let me, because 
I can't resist, and I used to be the deputy comptroller of the Defense Department, uh, I, I have to answer the budget question. There, there isn't a climate change line in the DOD budget. The, uh, the, the, this is, is more about how you spend money than what you spend. If I'm going to build a new building and I decide not to build it in a floodplain, is that climate change spending or did I need that building anyway? Uh, it is how am I spending my money rather than uh, what money am I spending, I think is the key question. And DOD wants to be able to take risks into account. Um, that's, that's the crucial point. You know, don't, don't make me do something stupid. Uh, in either side of the equation. I don't want to waste uh, a lot of money putting in a project that doesn't have a return on investment either. But if, if I can avoid a risk by spending my money smarter, uh, if I need to re replace a pier because I need to replace the pier and I want to build it a little bit higher so it lasts longer, why, why, why wouldn't I be able to do that? So, so that's more, more what it's all about. All right, we are, new, we are at the end of our time. I'm gonna give our panelists uh, a last opportunity to give sort of a 30 second closure and, and then we'll hand it back. Are we, anybody? No, all right. So, uh, so everybody wants to, wants to be finished up. I think, Carol, were you gonna give closing comments? I had it on my uh, agenda. Thanks very much. And, and on behalf of our whole partnership, uh, we want to express our appreciation to all of you for being here, for also uh, for those of you who are watching online. Uh, thank you, and please feel free to follow up with the center, with EESI, uh, in terms of any other questions or issues that you would like us to try and address in the future. These issues are profoundly important and we really need to be about problem solving and doing the best that we all can because we're all in the soup together. So thank you again very, very much for coming and thank you, wonderful, wonderful panel, terrific. <laughs>